The Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And it says in verse 2, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Last chapter, Jesus said that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get saved. And he also said what was impossible with man is possible with God. And in this chapter, Jesus will do the impossible by saving a very rich and a very corrupt sinner, Zacchaeus. <clears throat> Three, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the crowd, because he was little of stature. Being short created a problem for Zacchaeus, because the crowd was huge, and he couldn't see Christ. Verse 4, And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Zacchaeus was short, so he had to try harder. And there's where there's a will, there's a way, right? And since he wanted to see Jesus, he climbed a tree. Zacchaeus was short. We all have problems. We all have disadvantages. We all have weaknesses that are peculiar to us. But people who want to do the right thing don't use those weaknesses as an excuse not to do it. They fight through them. They try extra hard. Five. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. No one in that crowd of Israelites would have believed that that no good thief and tax collector Zacchaeus could possibly have a heart for God. But Jesus knew that deep down he wanted to change. And if we supply a willing heart, God will give us the grace to change for the better. Seven. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he has gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. So the Lord Jesus Christ once again angered the Pharisees. What else is new? You know, you have to anger no account prideful sinners like that or you're not doing your job as one who proclaims the word of God and lives the truth. You're making people like that happy. You're not, you're not living right. And you're watering down the message of God's word. Eight, and Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus knows that it took a lot of grace for God to save him, and he appreciates it. If someone is saved, then they want to try, if possible, to make up for the bad that they used to do by doing good out of appreciation for God's mercy. Nine, and Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus had always been a son of Abraham by physical descent. Now he is also a spiritual son of Abraham because like Abraham, he was saved by faith. 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God has always been in the business of seeking out and saving the lost. That goes way back to Adam, the very first lost sinner. God sought him out. 
And if God didn't seek us out and do everything he could to get us to repent, we would grope around in spiritual darkness until our damned souls went to hell. And that's because lost sinners, by nature, stay away from God. They hide from God. 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And right now people are thinking, when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, it's going to be smooth sailing. From that time on, he's going to defeat Rome. He's going to set up the big kingdom. Everything is going to be great. That's what they're thinking. So with this parable, he's going to try or try to lower their expectations. Verse 12. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And the nobleman is Jesus. After dying for our sin, he went into a far country. That is, he went to heaven. He went to receive the position he had before he humbled himself and became a man. And like the man in the story, he's returning. 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. In other words, do business. So before the man leaves for the far country, he dishes out some assignments. He gives each servant's each of his servants, a job and the means to do that job and some time to do that job before he returns to judge their work. And so in this story, it was a time of testing. And now is the time of testing for Christians. What are you going to do with the time, the gifts, the calling that Jesus has given to you? 14. But his citizens hated him. And sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. The citizens sent word to the man that they were going to do things their way. And he had no right to rule over them. And this pictures the Jewish rulers along with most people. They rejected Christ. In essence, they told God, we don't want Christ. We don't want your son to be our king. We're going to do things our way. 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called to him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Notice, it says, and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, They didn't want the man in the story to be king. But he is. Most people do not want Jesus to be king and rule over them. But he is. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. Again, verse 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called to him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. It's time for the servants to give an account. Everyone is accountable to Jesus Christ. The lost are accountable for their sins. Christians are accountable for their faithfulness to Christ, which will, in some way, determine how much they enjoy eternity. But everyone's accountable to Jesus. Everyone will answer to Jesus. 16. Then came the first, saying, Lord, your pound has gained ten pounds. And he said to him, Well, well done, you good servant, because you have been faithful In a very little, you have authority over ten cities. So this man used what he had. He used it faithfully. And he was rewarded according to his faithfulness. 18. And the second came, saying, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be also over five cities. 
So this man had been given the same opportunity as the first, but only did half as much with what he had. As a result, his reward was half that of the first man. And we learn from this that a Christian's dedication to God does make a difference. If we are faithful to Jesus to a lesser degree, then we will be rewarded, but to a lesser degree than someone who went all out for Jesus. 20. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is your pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared you, because you are a exacting man, exacting man, a harsh man, a rigid man. You take up that you laid not down and reap that you did not sow. And so this man's view of God was twisted. He didn't know God as well as he should have. If he would have, he would have known that God wasn't unfair and harsh. He did not understand God, so he did not love God. And since he didn't love God, he did not serve God. And there's a lesson for us. The more we know God, the more we know Jesus, the more we will want to do for him, the worse we're going to feel when we fail him. And that's why the Word of God is so important, because the Word of God bridges that gap between us and God. 22, and he says to him, Out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. In other words, you're right about one thing. I am a severe man. I mean business when I judge, and you're going to find that out right now. 23, wherefore then gave not you my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with interest? In other words, you should have at least invested my money in the safest possible way so that it would have earned a little bit of interest anyway. Now, this servant was lazy and he was indifferent toward his master. He was a servant in position. But you could never tell that he was a servant by observing his actions. And some people today are Christians in position. But like this man, the evidence of their relationship with God would be far too little to convince any jury. 24. And he said to them that stood by, Take from him the pound. And give it to him that has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. So the one who earned the most was given more to work with. Makes sense. Like any wise business person, the master will put his money where it has the best chance of growing. And when God sees that a Christian can be trusted to do little things right, he will entrust that Christian with even more opportunities. 26. For I say to you that to every one which has shall be given, and from him that has not, even that he has shall be taken away from him. In other words, faithfulness to God leads to rewards. But a Christian with a bad attitude is going to find that his life will be wasted and he's going to know it in eternity. He'll have nothing to show. 27. But those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring here and slay them before me. So the three servants represented three Christians with different levels of commitment to Christ. The enemies mentioned here are not Christians. They don't just lose rewards. They suffer. I mean, they lose their soul. Notice 27 again. But those my enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring here and slay them before me. Notice that it's not the number of sins that a person commits which will determine if they will go to hell or not. It's the one sin of not wanting Christ to reign over them that determines that. 
Rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the sin that seals a person's doom. Verse 28. <clears throat> and when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. So Jesus heads for Jerusalem. And as he does, he is looking humiliation, suffering, and death in the eye. And he is not backing down. Talk about heroes. Jesus should be at the top of everyone's list. 29. And it came to pass when he was come near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Uh, Bethany and Bethpage were both only a few miles from Jerusalem. Verse 30, saying, Go you into the village opposite you, in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him here. Jesus had not been in that town, but he knew there would be a colt and that it would be tied. And he knew where to send his apostles to find it. He knew these things because he is God. 31. If any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of him. The Lord needs that particular colt because Jesus knew that no one had ever rode it. And that's important because the Bible teaches that the only animals that can be used for sacred purposes are those which have not been used for ordinary purposes. 32. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said to them. And remember, they were told, they were not told to ask for the donkey. They were told to take the donkey. They did. And everything fell into place as we will see. There may have been some concern on behalf of those apostles, but it turned out fine. And that's because God never lets us down when we do things his way. 33. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said to them, Why loose you the colt? So there was more than one owner, which could make taking this colt even more difficult in the natural realm. One owner may allow it, and the other one may not like the idea. It might have been a problem, except for the fact that Jesus is God, and God has the minds of all people in his hands, and is able to make them agreeable to anything that he wants. 34, and they said, the Lord has need of him. And notice how they use the exact words that Jesus told them to use. They stuck with the word of God. They didn't feel the need to strengthen their argument. They trusted Jesus. You know, the more we let God speak for himself, the better things will be. God accomplishes his will when his words are not altered or overshadowed by our own words. 35. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And so the apostles put their garments on the colt for Jesus to sit on. 36. And as they went, they spread their clothes in the way. So the crowd threw down their garments and made a carpet, as it were, for Christ. 37. And when he was come near, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. People understood that Christ was making a statement by riding into Jerusalem on that day, on that donkey. He was claiming to be their Messiah and King. And the crowd was going wild because they thought he would crush Rome and immediately usher in a utopian world. 38. Saying, Blessed is the King that comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And their praise was loud. 
But their praise was also shallow because it was based on what they thought Jesus would do for them rather than who Jesus is. See, when it becomes clear that he will not crush Rome, their praises will quickly turn to jeers. The primary reason to praise God is because he is God, not because what we might think he will do for us. 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said to him, Master, rebuke your disciples. See, the religious leaders see their popularity slipping away. They want to be the center of attention. And so they are bothered by the attention that Jesus is receiving. It doesn't matter what so-called ministry it is. If it is there to keep itself going or draw attention to some individual rather than serve the interests of Jesus Christ, it ought to go out of business. 40. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If the people quit praising, the rocks will praise. You know, and, and why? Well, because the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would be praised on this day and in this way. And if the people don't cooperate, God will cause the rocks to praise because the Bible is true and Scripture must be fulfilled. That's why Jesus said this. One way or another, he was going to be praised because the Scripture cannot be broken. 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept, wept over it. So while the people are rejoicing, Jesus is crying. He knows that they want him to be their political and military deliverer, but not their Lord and Savior, so he knows they're going to reject him. They're, they're dedicated to a Jesus that doesn't even exist. They're dedicated to a Messiah that they have created in their own image and their own likeness. 41 and 42 and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, at least in this your day, the things which belong to your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. This was their day. This was their opportunity, the day they had waited for centuries to come to pass. Their Messiah is here, but they will reject him because they refuse to submit to his lordship. 43. For the day shall come upon you that your enemies shall cast a trench about you and compass you round and keep you in on every side and shall lay you even with the ground and your children within you and they shall not leave in you one stone upon another because you knew not the time of your visitation. No wonder Jesus was crying. There was a scene of destruction and bloodshed and murder like the nation Israel had never seen seen going through his mind like a movie. And these things will all happen to them because they will not repent and welcome Christ as their Lord and Savior. And these terrible things did happen 37 years later. 45. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. First order of business, once he's in Jerusalem, go to the temple and throw those who were using it like a midway at the fair, throw them out. Jesus rode into Jerusalem as the king, and he's cleansing the temple. And that's an act of his authority. And by his actions, he's saying, I am God, this is my home, and this is a sacred place, and I'm not going to let you get away with this. Any more than you would let somebody come in and desecrate your house. 47, and he taught daily in the temple. But the chief priest and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do. For all the people were very attentive to him, to hear him. And so it is now Monday of Holy Week. Jesus will teach on Monday and Tuesday. And that'll be it. 
And as we see, he was still popular with the common people. But the leaders want him dead. They were evil. And he exposed their evil. And they hated him because of it, rather than repenting like anybody who loves truth would do. They want to destroy the light. 